Okay, so good morning and welcome. I'll start my webcam. So So my name is Annabelle Gutierrez, and uh, I work at the Center for Autism at the University of Miami. Uh, I'm a behavior analyst, and I've been working with uh, individuals with autism for, I don't know, something like 17, 18 years now. Um, I forget, I lose track. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about um, identifying the function of problem behavior in an effort to understand uh, behavioral problems or behavioral issues. So the title of the talk is What's the Function? understanding your child's behavior. Okay, um, sorry about that. And so for today, the goals of our presentation are to understand some possible causes for quote unquote problem behavior or undesired uh, behavior. And we're gonna talk specifically about a procedure called the functional analysis, which is an assessment designed to identify the reasons or the function or the maintaining variables for problem behavior. We'll also talk about some techniques to manage the behavior as well as discuss a crisis management plan for when behavior outbreaks do occur. Now, <clears throat> it's common for us to talk about problematic behavior in the home, um, but we should probably be a little bit more specific whenever we're dealing with our, whether it be a behavior analyst or teachers or some professional, um, that we really understand what it is we're talking about. So it's important for us to define whether or not we're talking about a tantrum, which is a very common, um, whether it be fighting, arguing, um, or non-compliance, which is a little bit more passive sometimes, but it can also be active non-compliance in that you are going out of your way to engage in some other behavior other than the behavior you were asked to do, um, as well as disruption. So these are sort of the common problematic issues that we see we do from time to time see more severe problem behavior, um, whether it be um, self-injury or more severe aggression. Um, and those would still fall under this functional analysis paradigm. It doesn't mean that they couldn't be addressed in this way. Um, <clears throat> but we're not gonna really get into the, the details of those. Those probably require a few more um, specialized procedures. So for, for, the, for the most part, we're gonna be talking about these sort of common problems tantruming, fighting, non-compliance, and disruption. Now there are some, um, you know, there are some myths about why problem behavior occurs. Um, and I think a lot of us have, have probably heard these. Um, some of the myths include that the child must have some specific behavior disorder, and that that is why he or she is in fact engaging in this behavior. The problem with that point of view is that it really um, sort of make the inquiry stop as to why behavior is occurring because if we just assume that it's something the child has, that's, that's what it is. That's, that's all there is to be done. Um, and we don't really look at it from that perspective. We, we feel that problem behavior um, is maintained by environmental events. And I think that that is a very um, promising way of looking at it because it suggests that the cause for problem behavior is somewhere in the environment therefore can, in fact, be fixed. Another really common myth is that someone is setting a bad example. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, there is evidence that, you know, you can imitate behavior that you see in your environment, but that alone isn't going to account for why we're seeing continued rates of problem behavior. Another common myth or, or misconception is that the media is leading us to problem behavior, on TV is kind of an outdated reference now, um, or television or video games. And again, there's, um, there's reason, there are things that we could have some imitation from those sources, but again, that alone is not going to serve to maintain the kind of problem behavior and the frequency that our child is having in the home. Now, <clears throat> what we do know, what the science of behavior tells us, what the research literature tells us, is that behavior is in fact affected by the environment. Um, the consequences that behavior produces serve to maintain problem behavior. They can serve to strengthen problem behavior. And at the same time, they can serve to weaken problem behavior. So really, the source of the occurrence of problem behavior can be found in the environment. 
behavior that results in flavor or consequences will be repeated. And like I said before, that to me <clears throat> is a very promising, very encouraging way to look at it. And in fact, the research shows that the death of this is the case. Um, and so it's a field that I enjoy working in because I feel like it gives me an opportunity to really do something, get my hands on the kind of work that can affect how in behavior and make a change. And so, like I said here, a behavior that results in favorable consequences will be repeated in that context we call reinforcement. And ideally, if behavior results in less favorable behavioral consequences, then you can imagine that that behavior will probably not be repeated in the future. And so that's the concept that we're going to be working off of here going forward. Now, <clears throat> with that in mind, we can then think about what are some of the common functions, what are the, some of the common reasons uh, that we see problem behavior. What is maintaining problem behavior? If the reinforcer or the consequence is we try to the environment, then you can start to think that can probably come in various different forms, right? And so one of the more common forms of the enforcer in the environment um, is attention. Attention is a very big reinforcer, <clears throat> and it can form in, it can come in a variety of forms. One of them is to gain attention from the parent. Now, now when I say attention, um, I think that people will automatically think of attention in this very positive form. Pay attention to you, I'm talking to you about it. But the truth is that attention <clears throat> from parents and caregivers uh, will include reference. It will even include comfort treatment. Oh, I'm sorry, you don't have to. You don't have to do that. You're going to hurt yourself. Um, don't do that. I ask you not to do that. And so um, the explanation that sometimes we give for problem behavior or reprimands um, that we think that are necessary in order to maybe communicate that our child shouldn't engage in this problem behavior could very well be the actual consequence, and that is maintaining the and I think that that part is difficult for us as parents um, and teachers and professionals to observe problem behavior in our child and not say anything. We, we find that difficult to do. We feel like we have to say something. We feel like we have to educate or inform this person that they shouldn't engage in that problem behavior. But we should be really, really careful and realize that that attention may in fact be reinforcer or maintaining the problem behavior that we're trying to implement. Another possible source <clears throat> is attention from peers, the sibling. Again, the same thing. Um, it isn't just this positive attention where someone's saying, wow, I really like what you're doing. Um, the attention can come in the form of, you know, reprimands or discouraging statements from siblings. Don't do that. I don't like when you do that. Maybe the behavior makes the sibling cry. That is also a form of attention or interaction. And so we have to look at those as possible sources of reinforcers or consequences that may be maintaining this problem behavior in the environment. Another common function is gaining access to preferred activities. <clears throat> uh, so problem behavior may simply function to get access to things that you enjoy doing, whether that's a toy or television or playing a particular game, um, access to preferred activities is a very, very powerful way to make sure that it may serve to maintain the behavior. And in a very similar vein, uh, gaining access to preferred foods is also an extremely powerful reinforcer um, that often we see is maintaining the occurrence of problem behavior. And I think this one is fairly straightforward. You want some food, you want some item, you want candy, you want a bag, and chips, whatever it might be. Uh, someone tells you no, but then you engage in some problem behavior and you persist, or that person probably gives in and gives you the preferred food. And then finally, the last one that we'll talk about today is called escape or avoidance. And this is problem behavior that occurs in an effort to get away from, escape, terminate, or otherwise avoid or delay some sort of work demand or unpleasant activity. So I'm asked to do my homework, and I invent 
million reasons why I can't do it at this moment. Sick, tired, hungry, or I just start engaging in problem behavior. I cry, tantrum, whatever it is. Um, okay, so we have someone asking, uh, is anyone else having sound difficulties? Um, if you guys can't hear me, I can uh, try and put on a microphone. Um, so I'll wait a second to see if anyone else is having trouble hearing me. Okay, I'm sorry that it's hard to hear. Let me plug in a microphone <clears throat> and maybe that will improve. Or worse, or not at all. Maybe you can't hear me at all. Okay, great. Much better. All right. That's nice to hear. So sorry about that. Sorry that <clears throat> you had to listen to crummy audio. Uh, okay. I'm glad that's better. Okay. So no, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. I would hate to go through the whole presentation and find out only later that nobody could hear me. So I appreciate you guys saying something. Um, and so um, what we have here then are these common functions for problem behavior. And, and you can look at the word function. And just take that to mean that it is probably the reinforcer. It is the thing that maintains problem behavior. It is the reason for problem behavior. Um, I think that sometimes we look at problem behavior, we look at the occurrence of a tantrum or some severe outburst, and we always wonder, why is that happening? And what I want to communicate to you guys is that there, there is a reason why it's happening. It's not a mystery. I mean, it might be a mystery to you at this moment, um, but it's not mysterious. <clears throat> it isn't some sort of odd thing that you have to wonder about, like, why is this happening? You should take comfort in the fact that it is probably happening for a very good reason. It is happening to gain attention. It is happening to gain access to a toy or activity or food. Or it is probably happening in an effort to escape or avoid an unpleasant or demanding situation. That's probably it. It's one of those things, most likely. And that, to me, as a professional, is comforting because I don't have to wonder about some other difficult to pin down or difficult to treat cause. The evidence tells us that most likely it is one of these reasons. And if it is one of these reasons, the good news is there's something that we can do about it. So I hope that through this presentation, I'll be able to communicate that this is something that we can figure out and once we figure out it is something that we can in fact treat and so step one in this whole process is to find out like what i was saying why is this behavior occurring to begin with and so like i said there is a reason <clears throat> there's probably a very good reason and behavior really only occurs when there is a reinforcer i often tell my students behavior doesn't occur for no reason. Nothing happens for no reason. There's always a reason why. Um, and we just have to figure out why. So you want to find out this reason. And when you're trying to find out this reason, I'll tell you that the form, the shape of the particular behavior is not the most important thing. It's important from the standpoint of being able to define it, being able to talk about it, being able to tell someone that's what it looks like there it occurred. So the form is important. But from our perspective, regarding trying to figure out the reason why, it's not all that important. It is the function, the reason, that's really, really the important thing. And that's why we conduct the assessment to try and figure out why it's occurring. And that assessment is called a functional analysis or functional assessment, depending on the degree to which you conduct that assessment. It's called functional analysis methodology, and it was developed by Dr. Iwata um, and colleagues uh, several years ago. Um, and it leads us to an answer as to why behavior is probably happen, happening. It focuses on the identification of the individual um, um, environmental variables that influence the occurrence of that behavior. And it is the hallmark of a contemporary approach to behavioral assessment. This is, um, this is a scientific approach. This is not us just guessing. This is not us just using 
very powerful reinforcers or punishers to stamp out or overcome the behavior. This is a really nice assessment that leads us to an answer as to why behavior is occurring and then leads us to a path towards treatment. And so the aims of this assessment, like I said, is to discover the factors in the environment that maintain behavior. And remember, there is a reason why behavior is occurring. That's the first part that we have to sort of agree to is this is happening for a reason. Now let's figure out that reason. And so we're going to discover that reason. We're going to discover that function. And the strategies to do that include the interview process, observation, and in when it's warranted and when time allows and resources allow, we will do a manipulation or an experiment to try and figure out if something really is in fact maintaining problem behavior. So we start off with the observations, we start off with the interview, and in the observations, we're literally going to go and take a look at the environment. When we take a look at the environment, we're going to learn a lot of things. And then we're going to conduct interviews with the relevant folks, whether it's the parents or the teachers at school. Um, and then the most formal assessment, and that's when we refer to it as a functional analysis. When we actually do the formal assessment, we might even do, like I said, the experimental manipulations. So the first thing that we do is define our behavior. What does it look like? How often does it occur? We want to get a sense of what's your number one issue? What's the number one problem? And here, once you define <clears throat> the behavior, you want to stick to that behavior for the length of the assessment. What I mean is that you may have multiple behaviors that are an issue. You may have tantrums and you may have biting. And that's okay. We're going to get to both of those, but let's do one at a time. So let's first define the behavior. We're going to define biting, let's say. And so what does biting look like? I think we all know what biting looks like, putting someone else's skin between your teeth and clamping down, right? How often does it occur? A couple times a day, let's say. And so now going forward, we're just going to focus on biting. We're not going to introduce tantrums because they might actually be maintained by different consequences. And so let's just focus on one at a time. Step two is to identify the situation. And this one is really, really uh, informative. When does the behavior occur? Okay, it occurs most often when he's told no, or it occurs most often when um, something is taken away from him. Perfect. You also want to know when the behavior does not occur. And that's also very informative. It never occurs when he has access to everything he wants. Great. Good information. You also want to identify the places. Does it occur at school? Does it occur at home? As well as where does the behavior not occur? And then step three is to try to determine why this behavior happened. What's the reason? What's the function? And you may conduct a functional analysis, like I said. Now, let me go back a few slides <clears throat> and talk about some of these other uh, strategies. So let's go talk about the observation for a minute. Let's say that we go into the classroom uh, and we're there to observe this biting behavior. And we ask the teacher, okay, let us know what time would be a good time to come um, observe in the classroom, or we ask the parents, tell us when it's a good time to observe in the home. Um, and they give us a situation in which behavior is occurring or might occur. And we are maybe watching the child at circle time, at play time. Um, and we see that when there are a limited number of toys to play with and this child can't get the specific toy, um, we might see some biting. And so we do this observation in which we are taking note of the environmental events surrounding it, but also terribly important is to look at what are the consequences when behavior does in fact occur. Child bites and what is the outcome? Maybe the other child cries, he drops the toy, and now our target child has the toy. These observations can be really, really helpful. However, they could just indicate a correlation. Uh, you know, I mean, correlation does not mean causation. Maybe that was a coincidence that he bit a child and he ended up with the toy. It's possible. But enough of those observations, and we start to gain some confidence that maybe this is what's going on. Next, we conduct the interview process where we ask the teacher or we ask the parent what they've observed. And maybe they tell us they've observed that very same thing. Now our confidence starts to 
increase, that maybe this is in fact why behavior is happening. And like I said, in both of these, we're paying special attention to events that occur before, as well as those events that occur after the behavior. And it's the after part that is key here. A lot of times parents, teachers, professionals will ask, why is this child doing this behavior? And the answer, without trying to be smart about it, is I don't know. We have to wait until he stops. What I'm saying is that it's really only when we get to see the consequence of behavior that we start to gain some confidence as to why. The answer is why lie in the consequences. Now, if after your observations, if after your interviews, um, it's still not clear or the behavior is so severe that it warrants further investigation, then you may conduct a full functional analysis in which we actually will manipulate consequences. We will wait for problem behavior to occur, and then we will deliver that specific consequence that we think is maintaining problem behavior. We'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. So let's get back ahead to where we were. And <clears throat> let's talk again about these possible functions. So the most common reasons for why behavior is occurring, uh, number one is to escape a situation, gain access to tangible, gain access to attention. And then the last one, which I won't spend too much time on, is called the automatic function. This one is reserved for when we see instances of behavior that seems to produce its own automatic reinforcement. So singing a song produces its own feedback, it's its own reinforcement. Scratching a niche produces its own feedback, its own reinforcement. That's not to say that we can't address those, but those are usually sort of a little bit of a separate category because the consequences aren't so readily accessible and they can be a little bit tougher. But not to say it can't be done. But we're going to mainly focus on the others. So escape. When we say escape, we're talking about a situation in which an individual is after a very specific kind of reinforcer. And that reinforcer is to escape, get away, avoid, delay a person, a task, or some environment. It's usually in response to a very specific person. It's usually in response to a very specific event. It's usually in response to a very specific activity or a very specific demand. Um, we've probably all encountered this when we ask someone to do something they don't want to do. Brush your teeth. I remember when my kids were um, little and we were working on brush your teeth for the first time. That was a difficult situation. And so they would cry and tantrum in an effort to escape brushing their teeth. Um, and so that's sort of a fairly common consequence that we encounter. Um, escape. Lots of people like to escape lots of things. So that one, I think, uh, is one that sort of makes sense and speaks to a lot of us. The other one is tangible. Tangible means that we are engaging in behavior for this very specific reinforcer, and that reinforcer is gaining access to specific items or specific activity. And we will most often see the tangible function present itself when something has been denied or taken away. So you say, no, you can't have this, or it's my turn, or this is all done, and we get the big tantrum. We get the meltdown, and we have to <clears throat> turn on the TV, I mean, turn off the TV, time to put away that toy, time to share that toy, or that child took your toy. So the tangible function, again, fairly straightforward. I think it speaks to a lot of us. Um, it makes sense. We understand why this one might happen, but sometimes it can go a little bit sort of undetected. We may not quite appreciate that there is a tangible function at play. We simply say it's over or we have to go and then we get this meltdown. And sometimes we are confused by that. So that's why we have to attend to the antecedents, the events that are occurring right before the behavior, and then also pay attention to the consequences of the behavior. If we, following the occurrence of problem behavior, now allow further access, or okay, one more minute, or okay, we can have it, but then we got to go, that's probably maintaining to some degree the occurrence of this problem behavior. Does that make sense? And then there's attention. We talked about attention a little bit earlier. 
Uh, and attention, like I said, can come in a lot of different forms. It's not just always this attention in the form of I'm talking to you, I hear you, yes. Uh, it's not always praise. Uh, attention can be a reprimand. Attention can be a look, someone giving you a look, or just showing you that they are attending to you, looking, making eye contact. Um, all those things can function as attention. And so attention is, of all of them, I think probably one of the more subtle ones um, and one of the trickier ones to uh, address. And the reason is not that there's anything really special about this function. It's just that our attention comes in so many forms and really just sort of is always coming out of us. We're constantly making eye contact or looking at or talking to the children and the adults and the individuals that we work with. And so the attention function comes in so many different forms. And that is really the only reason why this is difficult. Otherwise, it's just like all the others. But we'll talk about how we actually address this function and you'll see why this one tends to be um, a particularly tricky one. The attention function will often happen when a specific person is present. We probably are familiar with situations when an individual or a child behaves one way in the presence of one person and behaves totally differently in the presence of another person. And it's probably because of the attention. This person gives me the attention, or this person has the attention that I like, while this person doesn't. Now, like I said, the automatic one <clears throat> is kind of a tricky one, uh, but we'll talk about it here. Automatic is a function um, in which when we engage in behavior, the behavior in and of itself produces an outcome. The behavior feels good in its own right. It produces its own reward. We'll often call this the sensory function. So why do you do that? Why does the child engage in this behavior? Why does that individual do this? Because it feels good. Um, when we see this function, we're likely to see behavior that is occurring in most situations. That's different from the other function. When we have behavior maintained by attention, we're likely to see that behavior in very specific places and times when the attention is withdrawn or when that individual is in place. When we have a tangible function, we're likely to see that situation where the items are present or when the items get removed, right? And so we have these, um, we have these sort of scenarios in which the functions sort of present themselves. However, in the automatic function, that sensory reinforcer is always available. And so we're likely to see the automatic function or behavior maintained by automatic reinforcer occur in most situations. And in particular, that behavior may occur when no one is around because you don't need anyone to engage in behavior that produces its own rewards, okay? Now, <clears throat> like I said before, when it's warranted, and when you have the time and the resources, um, you may conduct a functional analysis. And you can do five minute sessions, you can do 10 minute sessions, there's a variety of ways in which you can do a functional analysis. And if you're interested in that, I would encourage you to look up the studies conducted by Dr. Iwata uh, on functional analysis methodology. Um, and what you do in a functional analysis is during this five minute session where you're in the room with the individual, you're in this room with the child, you will manipulate, you will deliver one possible reinforcer at a time. And I mean one possible kind of reinforcer, meaning you will deliver the attention, let's say. And what you do is, and I've run functional analysis uh, before in, in my training, um, let's say that it's me and the child in this room, and I'm going to run an attention session. And so we might start the session and I might be chatting with this child for a minute and then I'll say, okay, um, listen, I have some work to do. So I'm just going to sit back here and read my magazine while you can play with whatever toys you want. Now, the interesting thing about this session is that during this session, this child will have access to toys. So he will not be motivated by toys. He won't be motivated to engage in any problem behavior to get toys because he already has toys. There will be no work demands. 
So there will be no motivation to escape a work demand because there is no work demand. And so we create only one situation that could possibly reinforce problem behavior. And what we do is we withdraw our attention. So I might say to this child, okay, buddy, you go ahead and play, and I need to do some work. We might take out a magazine or a book to read or some piece of paper, and we might start sort of working. So now we've removed our attention. If at this point problem behavior occurs, let's say the child starts to tantrum or starts to hit me or starts to maybe bite themselves, at that point I will say, hey, buddy, you don't have to do that. Don't, don't do that. Let's talk. I'll talk to you. And we will deliver that attention for 30 seconds or a minute, as we might decide before the intervention period and assessment starts. And I know this may seem odd, like why would you do that? Um, and the reason we do that is because we're trying to test. We are trying to see if, in fact, this does reinforce the behavior. After 30 seconds of me delivering this attention or over, I might say, okay, buddy, you go ahead and play. I'm going to go back to work. Then we go back to work. Immediately, child hits me again. I say, hey, don't do that. And I deliver the reinforcer all over again. We do that for five minutes. And if during those five minutes, the frequency of behavior is very, very high, that suggests to me that maybe this child is sensitive to attention as a reinforcer. After that session is over, we will then conduct a similar session, and we will only control for toys as a potential reinforcer. What this would look like is that I'm going to be giving him my attention. There will be no work demand. But the only thing I do is I keep taking the toys away. And I keep saying it's my turn. And I take the toys away. If he hits me, I give him the toys back. If he doesn't hit me, I just keep playing with the toys. This may sound odd or a little funny to you to a child, but we're testing to see if losing their toys causes them to engage in problem behavior in an effort to get them back. If it doesn't, and that session stays low, then maybe toys are not the reason why he's engaging in problems. When we go through this functional analysis, manipulating one potential reinforcer at a time, we collect data on the frequency, we pull it all together, and what we might end up with are these graphs that suggest one form of, um, of reinforcer over another. This is borrowed from um, an article from the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis by Dr. Awada. And I'll draw your attention first to child number one. So imagine the scenario I was just describing to you. And for child number one, you can see that the closed circles represent academic condition. This is a condition in which I'm going to place academic demands on him. Only academic demands. And if he engages in problem behavior, I will give him a break from that academic demand. So this is the escape function, right? I make you work until you engage in problem behavior. And when you engage in problem behavior, I give you a break. Okay, you don't have to do that. Don't hurt yourself. Don't hit me. Let's take a break. After the 30 seconds are up, we go again. Okay, let's do some work. You hit me. You bite yourself. Okay, let's take a break. And we're testing for this sensitivity to that particular reinforcer. And if you look, the others, the social disapproval, which is the attention, the play, which is the tangible function, are all very, very low. They're at zero. And so the child never engaged in problem behavior to gain access to some attention. The child never engaged in problem behavior to gain access to toys. He only engaged in problem behavior when he was presented with academic demands. And so that gives us a pretty good amount of confidence that this individual is probably engaging in problem behavior to escape work demands. What that does is it then points us into a very clear treatment direction. It's not a mystery now why it's going on, and so now we can focus on treatment. What do we do? And the what we do is actually fairly straightforward. Theoretically, sometimes the logistics of carrying it out can be tricky. I'm not saying that this is all just a piece of cake, but the question as to what do we do next, that's fairly clear. How exactly do we carry it out? That's where it gets a little tricky. So take a look at child number two now. You can see that for child number two, we have high rates during academic, social disapproval, 
play as well as the alone condition, meaning that this child engaged in this problem behavior when he was alone. And so by that alone, you can imagine that the behavior could be done by yourself. Maybe it was self-injury. Maybe it was skin picking. Maybe it was hand biting. And so that pattern that you see there for child number two probably suggests a, an automatic function because it's occurring all the time. And the same might be true for child number four. The closed circles for child number four represent the loan condition. He's engaging in this behavior when he's alone. So child two and child four might suggest an uh, automatic condition, an automatic reinforcement function. And then if you take a look at child number five, it looks like maybe the highest rate came during social disapproval and some pretty good frequency there during the academic closed triangles condition. And so we might from this say, all right, um, it looks like he is doing it to gain access to attention and some escape. And then we would go forward with the treatment from there. Okay. <clears throat> Now, like I said before, the treatment is fairly, quote unquote, straightforward in that we know what to do. The tricky part is how do we actually do this? So I don't want to give you the wrong impression that oh, this is easy. Treating problem behavior is easy. That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting that it's not a mystery as to what needs to be done. Sometimes the difficulty is in actually carrying it out and executing it correctly. So the first thing that you want to do in treatment is to avoid giving the reinforcer after problem behavior occurs. Okay. Actually, before I move on to treatment, I want to take a second here and pause and give you guys the opportunity to um, ask a question. Um, you can use your chat type to ask a question, ask for a clarification, ask me to go back, ask me to slow down. Um, so let's take a quick pause here and give anybody at least you the chance to say something. Um, Ruthie's asking, can we get copies of the PowerPoint? Um, yes, I believe you can. Um, <clears throat> uh, the host, the Else for Autism Foundation, um, I believe would be able to provide that. Um, so yes, I'm pretty confident the answer is yes. Okay, anything else? I hope I'm not going too fast. Um, and these are the kinds of sort of you know, talks, presentations that you might see at uh, professional conferences in behavior analysis or even autism conferences where there's a talk focused on the treatment of problem behavior. You might see a very similar uh, presentation. So this is sort of this is not your one chance to hear this. You'll never hear this again. This is a fairly well-established way of dealing with problem behavior. And the articles exist in the research literature. Um, just use, I would suggest you use Google Scholar rather than just Google. It's a little service that Google has. It's called Google Scholar. And Google Scholar will provide you the research articles, not just the web pages that are all over the internet, but it'll actually lead you to the peer-reviewed or scholarly articles on the subject that you're Googling, okay? Okay, so then moving on past the assessment now, we have some indication as to why the behaviors occur. Maybe it's attention, maybe it's escape, whatever it is. And so the treatment is, we're clear on that we just have to avoid giving the reinforcer when problem behavior occurs. So this is a very straightforward line of thinking. The idea is that if behavior is maintained by this, then don't provide this. If we don't feed the behavior, the behavior will reduce. It's, it's that straightforward. The thinking is that straightforward. Again, the execution of it might be a little bit tricky. And then the interesting thing is that we take the reinforcer, right? and we stop giving it to problem behavior, and then we give it to an appropriate behavior. This is sort of the, the Robin Hood approach, right? Take from the rich, give to the poor. We're gonna take from problem behavior, and we're gonna give to appropriate behavior. And in order for us to do this, though, 
we have to have completed to some degree the assessment that I just described to you. If we don't do this, then we're guessing. And that's when I think things can get really, really frustrating when we're guessing as to the function and we're guessing on the treatment. And if we guess wrong, it's not going to work. And the part about guessing is that it can be really effortful to carry out a treatment that wasn't actually the effective treatment. So conduct the assessment, figure out the why, and then once we identify the reinforcer, simply put, don't give the reinforcer for problem behavior, give the reinforcer for appropriate behavior. Okay, so let's talk about how we actually do this. Escaping and avoiding work. Does problem behavior occur when child is asked to do a non-preferred task? Yes. Does problem behavior result in escape? Yes. Does problem behavior buy time? Yes. Probably going to be an escape function, right? So this is sort of reiterating our assessment. Does it gain parent attention? Does the problem behavior occur when the parent is engaged with another child or activity? Does the problem behavior occur when the parent is talking on the phone, talking to another adult, paying bills? Does the problem result in parent attention? Does the child usually get reprimanded or lectured? Yes, and it's probably attention. And this is a really, really tricky one to get our hands on conceptually because we as parents, we as teachers, we as professionals have this sense that if a child is interrupting or engaging in, in inappropriate behavior, it is sort of our job to correct them, to turn to them and say, you're interrupting me. Don't do that. Please wait. I told you this before. Just wait till I'm done. And we start engaging in all this attention. And that is the trick. That is the problem here, the pitfall of the attention function is that even when we think we're not paying attention to the behavior, we probably are. We see people all the time saying, I'm not gonna pay attention to you. I'm not gonna have an argument with you about this. But we in fact are, by the pure nature that we're telling them that we're not gonna have this argument. We are having this argument. We are paying attention. We'll look at a child, we'll give them that look. All of us parents know that look, right? Um, that is attention. And so attention is a really, really tricky one because the attention sort of keeps coming out in all kinds of different difficult ways. So we have to be really, really sensitive. We have to be really thoughtful and kind of honest with ourselves and step back and say, I think I was just attending to it, even though I intended not to attend to it. So that one is a tricky one for sure. Another tricky one is does it gain peer attention? Does the problem behavior occur when peers or siblings, when their attention is diverted? Does problem behavior result in them getting attention from a peer, whether it be a laugh or complaining or crying or whatever it might be? And we have to look at those as possible sources. Those are a little trickier um, because as much as we struggle to control our behavior, at least we have control over our own behavior and our own attention. It can be a little tricky to try to get siblings or peers not to attend, not to laugh, not to cry. So that one can be a little bit of a challenge, but we have to look at those possible sources of attention. And then gain access. So does the problem behavior occur when access to preferred items or activities are restricted? Yes. Does the problem behavior result in access to preferred items and escape from non-preferred activities? Yes. Then there's probably an access tangible toy play function. Child is engaging in this behavior when items are removed, when items are restricted. And so behavior is maintained by access to the item. And we've probably all done this. Okay, one more minute, and then we have to put it away. One more minute, and then we have to go. We're trying to avoid this big tantrum, but we're actually maintaining that problem behavior by giving further access. And so remember, what does that slide say? Don't give the reinforcer. And then take that reinforcer and give it to appropriate behavior. So when we manage behavior in the home uh, or in classrooms, it's important to understand why. This is going to help us manage behavior. And I will talk to you guys a little bit more about how exactly we do this. Um, we can be proactive. We can try and prevent future problem behaviors from occurring in that we can sort of arrange environments. Uh, if we see that kids are fighting over the toy, then we might just have to get two versions of that toy such that there is no fighting. Um, 
there are also reactive strategies that we have to consider. And reactive here isn't a bad word. It's are we going to set up the environment and then what are we going to do once problem behavior actually does occur? So we're going to have both kinds of approaches. And then I would also encourage parents and teachers to plan ahead for really unexpected behavioral outbursts and have a crisis intervention plan in place. What happens if? Um, and this is sort of part of my regular consultation with families when we're talking about problem behavior and when we're going to start intervening, what will often happen is behavior will in fact get worse before it gets better. We will interfere with the normal reinforcement pattern of the behavior and it will actually cause an increase. During that increase, we can have some new, unexpected, unseen behaviors that can in fact be dangerous. So I stress to the families that I work with that they should have a crisis intervention plan. They should plan ahead. They should do these procedures when they feel comfortable, when they feel like they can control the environment well. Maybe you don't start this treatment out in public. Maybe you don't start this treatment when you're home alone and your spouse or other family members are nowhere to be found. So do these things in a way that is safe, that is planned, that is thoughtful, and have a crisis intervention plan in place. I'm not trying to scare anyone, but I do want you to think about these things. For the proactive procedures that we might do, we might set up house rules to make the expectations clear and not make them not make consequences seem so sort of out of nowhere. We can warn children. We can present these visually. Um, parent behaviors that command good behavior from children, right? That's these structures, it's these routines. Um, and we also want to create these structured and enriched environments at home where there is lots of access to these reinforcers for appropriate behavior. Sometimes we lose sight of what it is that children are supposed to do. And, you know, all grown-ups do this. We're not kids, so we lose track of well, what are they supposed to do? Are they just supposed to sit there quietly? The answer is no. Let's give them something to do. Let's create a structured, enriched environment in which they can be entertained, they can be engaged, and not have to resort to problem behavior to gain access to toys, to gain access to attention. And so if we can sort of set some of these enriched environments up, appropriate environments, I'm not saying create a free-for-all, um, disruptive environment, but if you create these enriched, engaging activities, we might see that some of this problem behavior gets sort of sidestepped because you haven't created any reason to engage in problem behavior, right? These are proactive. We are going to see problem behavior. We will need reactive procedures. So if you establish and maintain your house rules, you might enlist the child's help. You might ask them, what things are allowed here, what things are not allowed here, and what do you think the consequences should be? You clearly state those in advance, clearly tell them what is and what's not acceptable. You even role play the scenario. So let's pretend this happens. What am I going to do now? What's going to happen to you? What's going to happen to the toy? You rehearse the procedures. You even give feedback during that rehearsal. And now, when it happens, maybe it won't be so shocking that you're implementing these rules. And if they've had some hand in it, I'm not going to say that they're just going to be, oh, yeah, you're right, I broke the rules, take my toys away. That's not going to happen. Um, but the surprise or the shock of it might be diminished to some extent. Now, <clears throat> there are also some behaviors that sort of command appropriate behavior from children. If parents can position themselves in a way in which they can provide this high degree of visibility for themselves, that might prevent some problem behavior from occurring, especially if that behavior is something that the child would like to engage in without you seeing. You want to scan the house frequently. And that's not going to just sort of thwart behavior in that you're some authority figure. If you position yourself in a degree of high visibility, if you scan the house frequently, you will see problems before they occur. You might see they're running out of paper to color on. Let me get more before they have to fight over the one piece that's left. The crayons were missing colors, or we don't have enough toys, or they're running out of the snack, 
And so it's not just that you're going to have some authoritarian sort of stamping out of behavior. You're also going to be able to foresee issues as they arise. And you want to administer praise contingently and use specific praise. I like the way you're sharing that. I like the way you're playing. Keep playing quietly. You're doing a good job. <clears throat> and then when you create these structured environments, you want to plan ahead and have activities ready. Transition quickly and smoothly between the activities, set up your routine, and stick to it. If you have activities planned ahead, things will work fairly smoothly. What this means is there won't be time for problem behavior to emerge. There won't be the need. There won't be the motivation. There won't be the downtime where problem behavior is likely to occur. So whenever you can, try and make these activities flow smoothly, make them fun, make them inviting. And then, of course, share the ideas with other parents. I think that one of the more difficult scenarios are sometimes weekends when the structure that is provided at school or the daily routine is missing and the weekends can be challenging. I would suggest that you just try and structure your weekends. Um, I know that we all need to rest. That's not what I'm suggesting. But just create this activity. Maybe create a visual schedule. First, you're going to watch TV. Then you're going to play iPad. Then you're going to color. Then you're going to take a, a nap. Then you're going to have a snack. It can be your regular resting routine, but just lay it out and try to follow it so that it's predictable and there is a routine in fact in place. Now, the reactive procedures, and I think this is what we are all truly interested in is, what do I do when behavior happens, right? There's lots of strategies that we'll talk about. One of them is called active ignoring, not allowing escape, timeout, and then rewarding appropriate alternatives. So let's talk about active ignoring. <clears throat> active ignoring is this tool that we use predominantly when the behavior is maintained by your attention. Active ignoring can be really, really powerful because it withholds the reinforcement. And again, remember, behavior occurs for a reason. If behavior occurs and that reason no longer follows, over time, behavior will decrease. So if behavior occurs for attention, then we stop delivering the attention. Over time, that behavior should decrease. Now, active ignoring is not ignoring your child and letting them do whatever he or she wants. It's not what I'm suggesting here. If you attend to the behavior, then you may be reinforcing it. So what do you do? What do you do if the child is doing something dangerous? You intervene, but you don't have to talk to them. You don't have to say anything to them. You just intervene physically, make sure they're safe. What if the child threatens to throw the phone? Do I say something? No, just go take it from their hand. Don't say anything. I think we're all tempted to say, don't do that. Like that's gonna stop them. Uh, or you know you're not supposed to do that. You're gonna break it and then you won't have it. All true, but all totally unnecessary, and probably, worst case, probably actually reinforcing the problem behavior that we wish would go away. Does this make sense? So what we're doing here is not ignoring in a sense of like, do whatever you want. I'm not suggesting that. That's actually quite dangerous. You should never do that. Uh, we're just not going to give you the attention. We're going to intervene physically. We're going to intervene to keep you safe. We're not going to let things happen to you, but I'm not going to talk about it. And it's really, really hard for us to do. Most people struggle with this part because it is in our nature to talk. It is in our nature to say things. It is in our nature to make eye contact and say, don't do that. Um, so it's actually something you might need to practice. You might need to practice with other parents. You might need to practice with your professionals, with your spouse, with your significant other, with your family members. Practice ignoring, but still intervening. It's, it's, it's a good skill to have. Um, and it will come in handy because you won't be reinforcing problem behavior. So how you actively ignore, you briefly remove all attention from the child. And like I said before, you ensure safety. Block and ignore, and then safety-proof your house. Make it such that there aren't a million potentially dangerous things laying around so that you don't have to keep intervening physically. 
And that's how you actively ignore. You remove your attention, but you keep everybody safe. So <clears throat> when you remove your attention, again, remember, do not scold. Do not argue. Do not turn your head. I mean, turn your head to avoid eye contact. Do not make eye contact. Don't show anger. Don't, don't do that. That is actually attention, and that could be maintaining problem behavior. I can tell you from personal experience, my kids like to see me angry. Um, and so that maintains their problem behavior. So don't act angry. Um, get absorbed in some other activity. Pick at your nails. Start doing something else. And then give the child lots of attention when he or she behaves appropriately. That's really the trick here. Remember that um, steal from the rich, give to the poor, Robin Hood thing? This is it right here. You don't give attention for problem behavior. You give attention for the appropriate behavior. Over time, this will take time. This will not stop behavior from occurring. This will not tomorrow magically make it such that we never have problem behavior again. Over time, this will decrease the occurrence of problem behavior. Now, moving on to escape. <clears throat> what is not allowing escape? Not allowing escape is making sure that the individual continues working even though he or she is misbehaving. Now, this one is tricky with individuals of a particular age or a particular size, right? This is easy to do if you're talking about a two-year-old having a tantrum. Um, you know, three-year-old doesn't want to brush their teeth, doesn't want to put their socks on, doesn't want to put their shoes on. Fine. We can just hand over hand, guide them through the task, whether or not they're tantruming. No big deal. It's a really effective tool in decreasing problem behavior that's reinforced by escape. Because if you engage in problem behavior and no escape follows, eventually the behavior will decrease. So this is easy to do, I think, relatively easy to do um, for young children. You just follow through with the task as if nothing is happening. You don't talk about it. You don't reprimand. You don't take breaks. You just finish the task. Now, it can be trickier with bigger individuals, um, <clears throat> adults, um, adolescents. I mean, I think even when you start getting up into the 9, 10-year-old range, it starts to become physically very, very difficult to do this procedure. Um, and so here what we want to do is we want to try and give some effective commands, clear commands, move close to the child, say his or her name, get eye contact, and give a clear, simple command. Put your toys in your room, clean up, please, put your shoes on, whatever it might be. Um, then you back up your command by physically guiding the child through the task and don't allow access to other activities until the task is complete. Now, like I said, easy for a young child, more challenging for an adult. And I think that when I've worked with adults, obviously, I can't physically guide them through a task. So that second bullet there um, really kind of gets eliminated or sidestepped. And then I focus on the third bullet, which is do not allow access to other activities until the task is complete. So you have an adult who is going to escape. They are physically bigger than you, they are going to escape. Or you have a child or an adolescent who is going to physically escape. That's okay. Don't get into a physical altercation where someone's going to get hurt. But what you do is you try to make sure that there is no access to any other activities until the task is complete. And there you're kind of not really allowing escape still. You may not be physically guiding them through the task, and so it might look like escape, but the task demand is still in place because you can't move on. You can't have access to any other activity. And I feel like that's much more doable. Control access to other activities maybe is something that if we can't physically guide them through the task, maybe we can control access. Maybe we can lock things up and put things away, right? So when you can't physically manipulate the environment, uh, physically, the child I mean, then you can at least manipulate your environment such that you can control access to the other reinforcers. And so the escape isn't really being allowed because you can't ever move on. You can't escape this situation. I can't escape putting my shoes on because I'm not allowed to do anything else until I comply. 
hope that hope that makes sense. And then, like I said, don't argue. Don't talk about it. Don't give any attention. Arguing only functions to delay, and delay is a form of escape. So don't do that. Don't argue. You might also consider a procedure called timeout. Timeout involves removing the child from their preferred activity for a brief period of time. And there is no great rule about how much time, but we probably don't want to exceed a minute or two. Um, now, the trick about timeout is that timeout means time away from a reinforcer. That is the actual definition of it. So you can't put people in timeout when there is no time in. I hope that makes sense. Timeout only works if the environment you're being removed from is a very pleasant, desirable environment. If that's the case, if you're having a great, great time and we're going to time you out for inappropriate behavior, it can be a really, really effective tool in reducing problems. That's assuming that the environment that you're in is very reinforcing and that you want to be there. So it can be this very, very effective tool if we use it correctly. We can't use it for timing people out for engaging in problem behavior in environments that are not reinforcing environments. Take a situation where the child is doing circle time, and clearly the child doesn't want to be in circle time. Or they're doing math homework, and clearly the child doesn't want to be in math homework. And they engage in problem behavior, and you time them out. That's not going to work. Because timeout in that situation is probably a blessing. Thank you for removing me from this awful situation. And so if anything, we may be actually reinforcing the problem behavior by simply removing them. So we have to be careful about timeout. Timeout, I think, gets a bad reputation. It gets sort of used very loosely um, with no oversight, and it gets probably used incorrectly sometimes. So timeout is an effective procedure if done correctly. Just consider how it's being done before, before you implement it. So what you want to do is you want to pick a very specific behavior, pick a relatively boring place for timeout, and then don't explain. Don't reason, don't scold, don't make threats, don't get really mad. Just very matter of fact, remove the child and put them in timeout. Don't threaten timeout, just do it. If time in is reinforcing, time out is really time out you do that once or twice for a specific target behavior and that behavior should quickly start to be done if not then one of these variables is out of place and it's not what you think it is time out is not functioning the way that you think it's functioning so don't get angry about these tricks these are all clinical procedures get clinical that's what i tell my families don't get emotional don't get upset don't explain, don't reason, don't get angry, just get clinical. We're going to time out. That's it. And if we're in fact executing time out correctly, then we should start to see a decrease of behavior. So when we do time out, we get the child there quickly. Again, this all sounds good when you're little, but what about bigger kids? For bigger kids, we can time out activities. We can time out the iPad, the TV, the basketball game, whatever it is, um, because we can't physically move them to time out, and that's okay. And then you want to make sure that you have some predetermined amount of time that the child will be in time out. Like I said, probably just a couple of minutes. Uh, anything beyond that is just probably not going to have any effect or diminishing return back to that. What you want to do is you want to show the child that you can be in this great activity as long as you're appropriate. If you're inappropriate, you have to step out of this activity. And then you get to come back and try again. And again, to reiterate this point, timeout can only be effective if the time in is, in fact, the reinforcer of preferred. So the last sort of reactive strategy that we talked about was reinforcing appropriate behavior. <clears throat> and reinforcement involves providing some reward contingent on the appropriate behavior, right? What you want to do is you want to increase the likelihood that this appropriate behavior will reoccur. So if you say to a child, okay, time to clean up and put away, and they start crying and whining and throw themselves on the ground, you don't want to reinforce that. 
but let's say you teach them to say one more minute please and you say time to clean up and they say one more minute please i think that there it's a totally appropriate opportunity to say yes you asked really nicely we can have one more minute and then we're going to put it away that is reinforcing appropriate behavior and that is what you want to do because you would much rather have that than a full tantrum throwing your stuff on the floor for one more one more minute of play so that's the trick to taking from problem behavior and giving to appropriate behavior so you want to identify your child's reinforcer you want to know what they like what does the child do what does the child say that she likes what do they do best how do they react to praise so that you can gauge what you should be using as your reinforcers some kids like tickles some kids like praise some kids like high five some kids don't so you want to be sensitive to what the individual reinforcers are because your reinforcers are not always going to be my reinforcers we have to be aware of that we have to be sensitive to that so when you are reinforcing appropriate behavior you want to deliver that reinforcer immediately after the behavior occurs and what you really want to be focused on is reinforcing appropriate alternatives to that problem behavior. So if the problem behavior gets the child out of work, then reinforce asking for help or asking for a break. You would much rather reward that behavior than have to deal with the problem behavior. If the problem behavior gets the child attention, reinforce asking for help, reinforce raising your hand, and then reinforce as often as possible. What we really want to do is get to the point where we have too much appropriate behavior. That's a different issue. And there, usually nobody's getting hurt when we have a lot of appropriate behavior. Or, you know, maybe he's escaping too much with his appropriate behavior. Okay, but at least we don't have these tantrums, we don't have this aggression, and, you know, we'll do some of that. And then finally here, I'll... I'll I want to make it clear that the expectation here that we have is not that parents are going to do this all. Some children do have special behavior needs. They do fall outside of what I think can be really reasonably managed in the home. And you might require outside help, and that's okay. That's what we're here for. That's what the Center for Autism and Related Disabilities is for, UMNSU CARD. That's what the ELF Foundation is here for. That's what professionals in the community are here for. Um, if the behavior has a significant negative impact on the family, seek help. If the safety of others is in jeopardy, seek help. If you feel like this is really just too much, just get help. I do not have the expectation that you will sit through this presentation and now go solve all your behavior problems. That's not what this is about. Um, this is about educating and having a good understanding of it. And yes, you maybe can go home and get rid of that whining. Absolutely. But if it falls outside of what you feel like you can manage, just ask for help. This is not a talk intended to say, that's it, you got it, you go home and you fix it now. So like I said, um, when it's too challenging, get help. There are board certified behavior analysts out there who can help you. There is a list of them. There is a credentialing body, behavior analysis certification board. Check to see if your provider is certified. There are board certified associate behavior analysts check to see if your provider is certified. Talk to your referrals in the community, UM CARD, talk to the ELF Foundation. They will guide you, they will find you the help that you need. And then the last thing that I included here in this presentation is some handouts. Um, they're not slides that we have to sort of go through, but these are intended to serve as handouts of what we just talked about, so that you can go home, print these out, and keep these as a guide. So back to the things that we've talked about. If behavior is maintained by attention, then the treatment is don't provide attention, right? And then we give you a list of things of what you should do. Do not provide attention when the problem behavior occurs. And then we try to give you examples. When the child is in circle, reading time, and pushes another child, don't give attention for that behavior. And then we also talk about things that you could do. Teach the alternative way to request your attention. Provide attention for appropriate behavior uh, and provide attention freely during the day. So these are intended to function as handouts that will stay with you after this presentation is done, hopefully. Um, these are fairly new. We just created them. We hope that you find those useful and they go through every function that we talked about. If behavior is maintained by gaining access to toys, if behavior is maintained by escape, here's what you do for the escape or break function. Um, 
this one's a bit longer because you want to get more involved. This behavior is maintained by automatic reinforcement. We even tackle the, the difficult automatic sensory reinforcement situation. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I hope that you find these helpful. Um, and like I said, reach out to, to your sources in the community for support, for answers, and also for qualified and credentialed professionals that can help you manage problems. Um, I know I went a little bit over, but um, I, I'm happy to, um, to answer any questions. If anybody has a question, um, feel free to type it into the chat, and I will read it out loud and, and do my best to answer it. You're welcome. All right, folks. Well, if there are no um, if there are no questions, thank you for um, for participating, and I hope the audio improved a little bit. And um, like I said, we're here to help. You have MNC Car, the L Foundation. Uh, please reach out if you have any um, any needs. And thank you guys. Um, thanks for coming, and have a good day.